So I've backed this up to this slide because I wanted to remind you of some of the things that we've talked about. Um, when we talk about uh, trajectories of electrons or where electrons are in atoms, we've come to the idea that electrons, because they have wave properties, can't be described by a standard classical trajectory where everything is known about the object, but instead we come to something called probability distribution maps. Now what does this look like when we use this idea in combination with Schrodinger's wave equations? So this is the first image that we'll look at, and I'll uh, use another program to sort of talk a little bit more about these. Uh, it's called uh, Orbital Viewer if you want to get it, and I'll put a link to it in the, uh, in the slide. But the probability density function for an, or an electron in the s orbital, so l equals zero orbital, for energy level one looks like this, okay? Um, remember, m sub l for this orbital is equal to zero, and that means it has, um, a, sorry, l for this orbital is zero, which means it has no angular nodes. So if you think about what an angular node is, remember, it's that line where the probability goes to zero, or that plane where the probability goes to zero. The only object that really is nodeless that way is a sphere. So this is like a basketball or a baseball. It has that shape, it's spherically shaped. And what we're seeing is rather than the exact position of electrons, uh, we're seeing a density map. And the density is low towards the outside of the sphere and high towards the inside. The wave function that gives us that, Schrodinger's wave function that gives us that, is this particular function. And this is for the 1s orbital. Another view is to use a solid surface to designate the shape of the orbital. And when we do that, actually, what we have to do is we have to take this surface and say, where would I find 90% of the points? And when you do that, you're not going to include all the, the points on the sphere. You might do something like this. Ooh, that's a really a little crazy there, but round shape like this. Okay, so that would maybe be the 90% probability of finding. So if you're inside there, that's where you'll find the atom or the electron. Uh, and this is what that shape would essentially look like. It would just look like a solid sphere. The number of uh, nodes in it is zero, right? And this is our, again, the 1s orbital. Um, I should point out, too, before jumping over to orbital viewer that uh, the Wikipedia has a really nice uh, page showing all the different atomic orbitals. Uh, and then what I'm going to show you now is a program called Orbital Viewer. It's a free program and it allows you to construct uh, different orbitals and you can plug in the different quantum numbers and see what the results are. Okay, so here we have, let's look at this orbital. We can look at its properties real quick. And hopefully you can see this. Um, but it says uh, n is equal to 1, so this is energy level 1. It's an s orbital. Now, s is uh, l value of 0, so you can actually even type 0 in there. It will interpret that value. And m sub l, there's only one value, so we'll make that the value. And now you can sort of see, if I turn it like this, that it has this sort of spherical shape. You can see the movement of the dots. Now what we want to do is superimpose like a 90% probability of finding uh, the electron. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a surface contour to this. So here's that shape, right? And uh, you can see it overlaid on top. I'm not sure why. The size seems a little funny, but it may be the way I have, I've traced out the points as well. Okay. And now what we're going to do is we're going to look at... Um, another orbital. So I'm going to bring up the uh, p orbital. Now to have a p orbital you have to have n equals 2 and then l is equal to 1. And if I hit OK here, I hit done, this is what the 2p orbital look at, looks like. And you can see how much bigger it is actually. Let me scale it back down. That looks better. Right, and and watch what happens when, let's see if I can get this thing back to be oriented the way I want it to be. So I've got it vertically oriented towards us. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change m sub l to minus 1. Remember, you can have minus l to plus l, and I hit done. 
and look what happens it's in this axis now so let me turn this so that it's facing straight onto it and then I'm gonna go back in and I'm gonna change L to be equal to 1 so that was minus 1 now I'm gonna make it 1 and what you should expect to see is it pointing straight in and out towards you like that okay so there's m sub l equal to 1 and then 0 would be the z-axis actually it's going this way so I'm just going to step down through these So this is a z axis that what we were just looking at was x and now we can look at the y axis like this this will be minus one and there's y so it's x in and out y going this way and z going vertically so this is a p orbital and remember in a p orbital m sub l can be three values l is one because it has one uh, angular node or a plane in which the probability density drops to zero and that's what you're seeing when you're looking at this space between these two halves which are called lobes so here's that shape that we were looking at and again I wanted to point out a couple of things this is the angular node in the middle it's where the probability goes to zero and this is what creates the shape of the orbital. And any node in, in particular, right, I'm not going to, I'll do it like this. Any node means zero probability. So there's no chance that you could find the electron there because the probability of finding the electron goes to zero. Now, these portions that are separated by the angular node in the p orbital are called lobes and I want you to make sure that you look at this image and compare it to what's actually given in the book for the most part books don't show the orbital shapes correctly in the book this would look something like this and the reason they do that is they're trying to give you an idea of its general shape. But if they drew everything like this, then you couldn't see, for example, you couldn't see another orbital sticking out in this direction. So if I were to put the DZ orbital on top of this, it would overlay on top this way, and you wouldn't actually, and down here, you wouldn't actually be able to see this other orbital underneath it. So these are really sort of artists renderings the ones in your book are really artist rend graphic artist renderings of what orbitals look like in, tr in trying to communicate to people what they look like or what their uh, properties are but in reality the orbitals are more spherically shaped which makes sense because the shape of an atom is a sphere right it's not these pointy things going in all directions but it's in fact these sphere shaped things that are surrounding the nucleus Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a d orbital, and there's a couple of different ones I want to look at. So I'm going to go into here, and uh, in order to have a d orbital, you actually have to have n equal to 3. Remember, d is a value of 2 for l, so that means n has to be at least 3. And I'm just going to put a random d orbital up there, so let's do this. And this is a d orbital and how it how it should appear to you uh, basically in terms of um, angular nodes and so let me go ahead and put this into PowerPoint uh, I want to point out that I had it uh, I was going to do the s orbital first and then I forgot so this is actually l equals 1 so now we have l equals 2 and there's two angular nodes that go like this okay and there's again these are the lobes so there's four lobes You'll also notice that the colors are different, and we're going to talk about that. We still have to look at the equations a little bit more, um, but I want to be able to sort of describe to you why we have different colors for different parts of the orbitals. So we're looking at the d orbitals again in Orbital Viewer, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to change 
uh, m sub l equal to zero, and this is the z orbital, z squared orbital is what it's called. And you'll notice that it's completely different shaped. And it turns out that this is the shape of the dz orbital. The angular nodes actually run in this direction. Okay, there's a conic node that comes like this, and there's another one that comes up like this. And so I'll try to sketch those out for you. So as I was saying, um, this is, um, as we saw in the, if you're paying attention to orbital view, this m sub l equal to minus 1. Uh, but when I went to m sub l, this is m sub l equal to 0. This is known as the dz squared orbital. And I'll show you all of these together. Oh, sorry. It goes at the bottom. dz squared orbital, like this. And again, um, when l is equal to 2, you expect there to be two angular nodes. And so there's one that's going this way. It's a conic node, so it's a conic section that goes like that, that surrounds this upper lobe and then there's another one that's down here so it's in this direction and it goes that's surrounding that uh, lower lobe uh, I didn't put it on there you can actually have it draw it on there but it obscures what the top and the bottom look like but again you have these angular nodes there's one cone that's here and another cone that's at the top and if you if you were to look down let me drop back over if you're looking down at it you can kind of see like there's a little donut. This is actually a donut shaped object known as a torus. Okay. Um, you can also do a cutaway. So if I do a cutaway of this, oops, I didn't mean to do that. If I do a cutaway of this, I can just cut it in half. Hit done. Oops, I didn't mean to do it like that, but we can turn it this way. And you can see the donut hole that's in it. Okay. I, I should have made my cutaway at a different angle. Let me fix that. Let's see if that helps a little bit. I just did a wedge cutaway. So you can see this is the conic, uh, the basically the ring, sorry. It's called the torus cutaway. And then this is cut out. So you can see that there's a little hole down here that leads to the bottom. It's sort of like a drain if you think about it. All right, so that's what that looks like. So in general, when you look at the orbitals, this is what all the p orbitals look like. We looked at pz. That's the one going straight up and down. And then there's x and there's y, right? And then for L equals 2, these are the d orbitals. The d orbitals have these names like dz squared. It, you can put a square there if you want to. It's dxy, dz, dxz, and dx squared, y minus y squared. And that's what these orbitals look like. So if we think about the dz, uh, sorry, dyz orbital, it still has the two angular nodes. Um, this subscript sort of terminology means the orbital is in the D, sorry, the Y, Z plane. Okay. And then if you're looking at XY, right, then it sits in the XY plane. So you can't quite see it, but if you look top down, it would look a lot like this. And then the xz orbital is in the xz plane. And the x squared, y squared is on the xy plane, but it sits on the axis. And then the z orbital, z squared orbital sits on the z axis and has this sort of uh, donut shape to it in the middle. Okay. Okay, so the last one to look at is the f orbitals. And... If it's an s orbital, you can have it when n is equal to 3 because, remember, we have 0 is s and then 1 is p, 2, this is for the l, l values, right? 2 is d and so 3 is f. And so and, oh, I think I said this wrong. Any any energy level above n equals 3, you can have uh, f orbitals, and there's seven of them. The seven are designated as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and they're minus 3 to plus 3. And they're like your book says here, it's, they're mainly eight-lobed objects. Um but the, tr the thing that they all really have in common is they have three nodal planes, okay? 
And you'll notice the Z orbital. Z they, it has this weird terminology, Z cubed uh, orbital, or the uh, X cubed or the Y cubed. Uh, you'll notice it has that same angular shape like this, and then another one that's along this axis here. Okay, And then it has one at the bottom. And then the rest of them are a little bit more like what you'd expect to see if you take a sphere and you cut it in every single plane and divide up the space, you would expect to have four lobes at the top and four lobes at the bottom. And you can create that by having uh, four, sorry, three angular uh, nodes. That's def again, that defines the shape. So what I want to do now is talk a little bit about the wave functions and something called the distribution function. And so let me go like this. I'm going to draw a wave function for a 1s orbital. And so this is psi 1s. And then along the x-axis, so that's my y-axis, is the probability uh, density function is what this is called. It's actually uh, squared, probability density function. And that goes like this for a 1s orbital. And, and this axis is the radius. So the way this graph makes it look is it makes it look like uh, the most probable place of actually finding the electron is at the nucleus. Because remember, this is the radius, and this function goes in both directions, so it's symmetric in both directions. At zero radius, that's where you'd expect to find the nucleus. And in fact, the probability density is actually highest at the nucleus, because that's, if you think about it, the electron is negative and the nucleus is positive, so they're going to be strongly attracted to each other. So the density of finding the electron there would be really great, except for one problem. Um, the, because this is a density function, it's the probability over the volume. Okay, so what that means then is if you think about what the rate, the volume is at the nucleus is it's almost zero. In fact, in the very center of the nucleus, it would be zero at the dead center of the atom. So what happens is the volume increases as you go out from the center like this. So this would be your volume function. You know, that's 4 thirds pi r cubed, if you remember uh, your volume equation for a sphere. You don't really need to know that, but it increases with the cube of the radius. So it actually rises fairly rapidly. This function, this probability density function, falls off fairly rapidly. So what ends up happening, when you actually look at the probability of finding an electron, for example, a hydrogen 1s electron in the atom, that probability density function turns into this. And this is known as a radial distribution function. So this axis here, this is still radius. And this is the actual probability, not the probability density. And if you look at the hydrogen atom, the peak point of finding the highest probability of finding the electron turns out to be in, and this is using uh, the wave equation function, so it ends up being 52.9 nanometers, which is the actual uh, radius for the hydrogen atom. It's about 110 for the diameter. So 52.9 nanometers, this is actually known as the Bohr radius. So we go from a probability density function to probability distribution functions, which shows us the actual how the probability varies as you go from the nucleus. Now I'm going to take another step back, and I want to go back to the psi, the wave function for, so this is psi now for the 1s. Okay, The psi for the 1s actually looks like this. Again, it has the same shape, it's just not squared now. Not very good at drawing these, by the way. Um, but let's do the psi for the 2s. 
Now it turns out as you go from 1s to 2s and you get larger, what you have to add is you have to add a, what's called a radial node. So the actual wave function looks like this. And then it's symmetric on the other side, which is what I'm trying to draw, but it's not going to come out very good, I can tell you that. So this is psi 2s. And even though it has a negative value here, that doesn't mean anything. The wave function is the distribution of the energy of the electron along uh, the radial path going from the nucleus, okay? So this is just the energy of the electron. So we have wave functions which describe the energy. We have probability density functions which are just the square of the wave functions. So if I square a 2s orbital, then my probability, so this is going to be psi squared, the probability function It'll have a very similar shape, um, but the only difference will be is that uh, all the values will be positive because I'm squaring it. So it's going to look like this on one side. It'll look exactly the same in principle on the other side, okay? And these will actually touch zero. So these are nodes. So when we were talking about angular nodes and the probability going to zero, zero, it was actually when one of the wave functions would cross through to zero and go negative and then come back positive again. That's how many of them are situated. So we have nodes, right, that exist both in the angular sense and the radial sense. Uh, in the radial sense, when you go up in energy levels, every time you increase the energy, you add a node. So let's go back to Orbital Viewer and look at a couple of these. Okay, so here's a, a 1s orbital, right? And um, I cut it in half so that you could see it. And you'd notice that there's no um, nodes in here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go in and I'm going to make it into a 2s orbital. So all I'm going to do is go up here, change it energy level by 1. And what you'll see, it got a lot bigger because I'm going to shrink this down now because we're going to do three as well. Right? Here's the one, here's the, there, here's the node, right, that surrounds a, uh, in this case it looks like it's an orange lobe, right, and a um, blue lobe, right. That represents the cutaway of the density function. So what we're looking at is this part here, right. And then this part here, these nodes are where it goes to zero. So that's the radial node that's been added. Now we're going to add another one, and we'll take a look at what happens to p orbitals as well. So now I'm going to change this into a 3s orbital. It's going to get much larger again. And it takes a while because there's a lot of dots. And so there's a, a node here. And there's actually a node in here. You can't see it, but there's supposed to be a separate line in here. So there's two nodes. The changing of the colors or the shading indicates the nodes. You can see a little bit of the orange in the middle there, if I turn it this way, at the center. Okay, So that's what we have. And then now let's go take a look at a p orbital. So let's go down, and we're going to take this to a 2p orbital. And then I'm going to turn it. Oh! Hang on. Let me just choose a different orbital. It's easier. Because um, it just cut the bottom, bottom lobe off, and that was kind of not useful. So this is a cutaway. You can see how it's flat there, right? This is the 2P. It would be two sort of semispherical, hemispherical shapes up here. Sorry, not semispherical, hemispherical. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it to a 3P orbital. And now, as you notice, it got larger, right? But now there's this radial node that goes in this direction. And you see this with every kind of orbital. As you increase the energy level, you add radial nodes to the orbitals.
So there's one other aspect to this that I want to get across, and it's the color coding that's often used. And you'll see this when you advance in chemistry, and you'll see this actually just in the next couple of chapters. So when the wave functions have a positive value, um, uh, scientists generally designate one color to the positive portions and one color to the negative portions. So for example, if if I wanted to do what people normally do, on the negative side, I would color it red. Okay. I think your book chose orange, I think just for artistic effect. And the positive parts are usually blue, um, and I'm just going to use this sort of lighter blue like this. So when you're looking at these orbitals, what you should be actually seeing is a 2s orbital for example or yeah 2s orbital for example should have one colored sphere in the middle and then on the outer sides of it you should have a different colored sphere so i could choose a, again i could use a different color for that and that would look like this okay now what i want to do is show you what a p orbital looks like so the wave function for p orbital has this appearance to it and uh, let me put this in a different color again so instead of being high in the middle it looks like this oh here I gotta give myself a reference point it actually has this shape to it so this is psi for p orbital uh, and this would if this is the uh, uh, z axis this would be psi z 2z 2pz sorry again it's the wave function and if I were to color code that then this portion would be red and then this portion would be positive like this now if I take the square of that function and make a radial distribution function out of it, okay, so we'll go ahead and do the square of it. It's going to shape like this, basically. And then, because it's going to be important later, we keep track of the signs of these different lobes. So even though now it's positive for psi squared, what I'm keeping track of is what its actual value is in the original wave function. And so this one will be blue like this. Okay. And then when you draw the p orbital out and you look at its shape, you're going to have a shape that looks like this for this one so I drew the DZ on its side unfortunately I probably should have gone a different way with it um, and then this orbital lobe would be red and this orbital lobe would be blue like this so when we were looking at the P orbital that's why the orbitals look like this where one side was one color and one side was the other. So I want to give you an idea why this is important, okay? So it, and this is going to become important in a number of different ways. If I have two orbitals, now these orbitals could be on the same atom or they can be in different atoms. But if I bring another orbital to this uh, mix here and I place it next to this atom and I make it so that the orbital wave functions go like this what happens when these two touch right well really what's going to happen is because this is a negative value and this is a negative value you're going to get constructive interference between these two orbitals that allows a bond to be formed between two different atoms so understanding that these 
shapes have colors, right? And that colors really represent these different wave functions allows us to have a better understanding of like how bonds are formed between different atoms. And in fact, it gives us a better understanding how in individual atoms, orbitals can rearrange themselves to accommodate different situations. And it's all going to be through constructive and destructive interference of the orbitals. When you're looking at p orbitals, it's relatively simple. One side's always one phase, right? Positive phase, for example, and the other side will always be the negative phase. And in d orbitals, those phases are alternating. So you have positive, negative, positive, negative. And there's never two phases that are next to each other that are the same. So let's summarize really quickly what we've learned in this uh, segment. Uh, Schrodinger's wave equations uh, describe for us uh, how the energy of an electron uh, can be distributed around an atom. And again, those wave functions, for example, have shapes that look like this for a 1s or this for two this for 2p like this going up and down and like this or also for this this is 1s 2p you could also have a 2s and the 2s function looks like um, this on both sides okay and we also talked a little bit about how those wave functions have signs and the negative portions, we usually attribute a red color, right? And the positive portions, we usually a red, orange color, or a blue color for the positive portions. And the, and the s orbital actually has just all positive on one side and all positive on the other. And sometimes it can be all negative on, on one side and all negative on the other. So every orbital has its own wave function. And then if we square that function, that gives us the probability, uh, probability density of finding uh, the electron uh, around the nucleus. And so this actually gives us our orbital shapes. So the 1s is not really any different. But if we square the 2p or the 2s, for example, we'll end up getting positive portions on both sides. And for the 1s, uh, we get um, positive, right, like that, on both sides as well. And then we still, again, attribute color to the different phases, depending on whether the original wave function is positive or negative. that well when we take volume into account and I really only did this for the 1s orbital this gives us the radial distribution function and the radial distribution function includes really the product of psi squared times the volume and remember the volume function increases with the cube of the radius the probability uh, density function falls off very quickly and so what we end up with is something look like that looks like this and that's the radial distribution function and that describes for us where we're most likely to find the electron um, for hydrogen this was around 52.9 picometers and we named that the Bohr radius because it fits with Bohr's model of the atom. And the last thing I was just going to say is the lobes have phases assigned to, the, to them. This, um, orbital lobes have signs associated with the phases of the original wave functions. And these become important because the phases will later be shown to add, can interact... Uh, in a process we called interference, um, but there's constructive interference where the phases have, the lobes have the same uh, sign, and they add and reinforce, and then we also have destructive. 
when we have destructive phases, those will cancel and sort of decrease electron density in a region. Okay. All right, so that's it for this chapter. It's a very long chapter. I'm just going to point out, uh, well, it has a lot of topics. It's not really that long. There's a lot of topics in the chapter. I did leave some of my old slides just hanging out in the back. So these are radial uh, distributions for the 2s and the 3s orbitals. And you can see the nodes, right? Uh, and then I also included this little example of a string. And this is actually from either another book or another section uh, in your book. So, oh, I did, I did forget to mention one other thing here. Uh, make sure you go back through and you look at the nodes and the lobes. Nodes equals zero probability. And the electrons are found in the lobes. This is where you find where electrons are found.